Okay, shifting perspectives a little bit, looking at a, 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 a different sociological approach uh, than the Strong programmers or Merton. Um, uh, in, in the 1980s, uh, Stephen Shapin and Simon Schaefer published a really interesting book called Leviathan and the Air Pump. Uh, and this is a book that tries to sort of understand the nature of the rise of modern science, not in historical, purely historical terms, not in philosophical terms, but in sociological terms. What they're particularly interested in is why did it happen at this particular moment in time that there was a major shift towards experimentalism. Why is it that experiments came to be the way to determine the nature of the world? Um, they, they focus in particular, as their title suggests, on a debate between the British philosopher Thomas Hobbes and the British physicist Robert Boyle. Um, they had a sort of a fund, fundamentally different ideas about how scientific disputes should be adjudicated. Um, now, according to Hobbes, and if you know anything at all about Hobbes, and again, his, his, his book, The Leviathan, is one of his most famous things. It's where the, the title, The Leviathan, and the title of this book comes from. Hobbes is known, famous as a political philosopher, and he thinks fundamentally what drives people thinking is political considerations. People are, are, are for, driven by certain sort of underlying psychological mechanisms, most, no, most notably for Hobbes' fear. Um, and the, the, fun, the, the, the basic uh, setup of any kind of political structure is going to be a reflection of people's underlying psychological dispositions and as these are molded by politics. Robert Boyle, by contrast, said that fundamentally answers in science should be adjudicated by evidence, by experiment. Um, this is something which, again, was a live debate. Hobbes and, and, and Boyle uh, had a correspondence, and they, 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 they criticized each other for, for different ways of thinking about the nature of science. Uh, now, it's, it's worth noting that Boyle was one of the first members of the Royal Society of London, which was one of the first sort of scientific communities. Uh, now, again, it, it's, it's interesting and strange to note how this sort of reflects both of these positions. The Royal Society is a sociological construct. It is something that has its own policies, its own politics. So Hobbes would sort of look at this and say, see, you're proving my point. You're setting up a, a system of political and social pressures to decide what the collective group should believe. This shows that I'm right, sort of the Hobbesian position is. Boyle, of course, as a member of the Royal Society, pu pushed back and said, yes, but the rules that we are setting up are rules that push us to follow the evidence. The motto of the Royal Society is in Latin, nullius in verba, which loosely translates to on the authority of no one or on the word of no one. We're not going to take political authority as the fundamentally decisive factor. Fundamentally, of course, it's going to be about evidence. Now, according to, to Shapin and Schaefer, uh, they wanted to use a particular concrete example to illustrate the point. Uh, the, the question of the day, one of the huge scientific questions, was whether or not a vacuum was possible. Vacuum in the sense of being you know, a, 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 a portion of the world that was completely devoid of air or any other uh, matter at all. Now, Aristotle quite famously said that a vacuum was impossible. Thomas Hobbes agreed with Aristotle. Uh, by contrast, of course, uh, uh, you know, uh, one of the Boyle's big contributions was to invent an air pump, which, you know, well, allegedly at least, created a vacuum. Now, from a sort of evidentiary point of view, the question, there's a difficult question here as to how we decide whether or not uh, Boyle's device, the air pump, actually succeeds in doing what uh, Boyle is claiming it does. Um, again, as Aristotle and Hobbes understand the question, the question of a vacuum is a metaphysical question. And metaphysical questions can't be settled by experiment in this way. Um, there, you know, even if uh, you know, the, the, the air pump appears to take everything out of the, 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 the vacuum area, uh, it's entirely possible that there is still matter in there or energy in there that we just can't possibly measure. Again, if you start thinking about 20th century science and the role of, uh, of, of Einstein's thinking and quantum field thinking and so forth. Again, you can start to see how this does, does get really, really complicated. How can we ever really know by looking at evidence that we actually have achieved a vacuum? And this all ties back into several of the themes of this course we've been talking about so far, such as the holism of testing and the theory latenness of observation and so forth. So the way Shapin and Schaefer read the history, Boyle could not answer the old question about the nature of vacuums. He couldn't answer the metaphysical question. So rather than trying to, what Boyle did was create a new way of talking, a new way of thinking about the nature of reality 
such that you could frame a new question in a way that could be tested by his apparatus, by his air pump. By doing it that way, the central shift was not so much from a uh, sort of a pre-evidence-based way of thinking to a, to a scientific-based way of thinking, as it's sort of often understood, but rather as a uh, uh, shifting from a world in which the fundamental questions of reality are thought of as metaphysical to ones where they're thought of fundamentally as scientific. Now, the key to winning this debate, again, crucially, was not to, by appealing to evidence. Remember, the evidence isn't what's going to answer the question here. Hobbes can look at all the same evidence that Boyle's looking at and still say the, the fundamental question hasn't been resolved. The key to winning the debate is instead constructing this new question, saying that Boyle's new question, that's the question that matters. That's the question that people should be interested in. Not this fundamental metaphysical question, which, again, seemingly by Hobbes' own uh, reconciliation, we can never really get a definitive answer to. So uh, in, in, the, in, the, in Wittgensteinian terms, uh, uh, the, the scientists started playing a new language game. When people follow Boyle's uh, uh, re uh, recommended way of thinking about reality, they're playing a different language game than the one that Hobbes wanted them to play. And of course, at least for the scientific community, it's Boyle's idea that ran out, uh, that won out, rather than this uh, uh, the, the sort of old view, the old question of, of Hobbes's. Now, Shapin and Schaefer make a, a strange claim, which I want to clarify it does not sound like what uh, many people think it sounds like. Shapin and Schaefer say that Boyle's air pump is an example of what they call manufacturing of facts. The claim is not that Boyle is falsifying his data or that he is you know, sort of f making things up in order to prove his point. That would be scientific malpractice, and that's not the claim at all. To, to my knowledge, and uh, uh, there's no reason to think uh, that, that Boyle ever uh, did anything in that sort of uh, that would violate scientific norms that way. Rather, what Shapin and Schaefer are getting at here is that facts are socially constructed. Now, this phrase social construction is one that means many different things to many different people. It can be very, very confusing. I can't claim to talk about, broadly speaking, about social construction. Uh, uh, I will say a little bit more about that in a subsequent lecture. Uh, but for now, I want to focus in particular just on what Shapin and Schaefer sort of mean uh, uh, when they're sort of uh, leaning into this kind of uh, way of thinking. Well, what they mean to suggest is that facts are not simply out there in the world to be discovered. They're not just there waiting for us to find them. Rather, facts have to be interpreted interpreted in the context of a theory or in Kuhnian language of a paradigm. It's simply not possible to get raw facts. Uh, raw facts, there's no such thing. Always facts are things that are social in nature. They are interpreted through a particular sociological lens. It is dishonest of us if we start saying as the, acting as if we have the view from nowhere, if, if we can see things the way God sees them. We have to admit not simply that we're looking at the world through a particular pair of eyeballs, but rather that we're thinking about what those eyeballs see in terms of of a particular intellectual and sociological history. A famous quote from uh, uh, Shapin and Schaefer from, from the book is, it is ourselves and not reality that is responsible for what we know. Um, this might be a bit of an overstatement. In fact, I, this seems to me like a clear example of something where this is a false dilemma. It seems like we can have our cake and eat it too. It is the relationship between ourselves and reality that is responsible for what we know. But that's again, that's my opinion. Now, I want to illustrate this with an example that they don't use, but, uh, but which comes from an excellent article, the author of whom is escaping my name at the moment, but it's called How Long is the Coast of England? Now, if you sort of, I ask you that question, how long is the coast of England? If you, if you don't know about this particular problem, you might naively think that there is a clear, factual, objective answer to the question, how long is the coast of England? And I want to demonstrate to you right here in a way that I hope is fairly visceral, that this is naive, that, that, that there is no straightforward, objective, factual answer to the question, how long is the coast of England? In fact, how long the coast of England is depends very much on sociological factors, on tools that you use to go about addressing this question. So here is one picture of the coast of England. Uh, I'm using, I, I don't know exactly what this measurement is here, but let's say, I don't maybe it's 100 miles, uh, something like that, right? Uh, maybe it's 50 miles, I don't know, whatever. Um, but if you, if you are measuring the coast of England in 50 mile or 50 kilometer sticks, you, will, you can add them all up and you will get the total distance of the coast of, uh, 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 coast of England measured in 50 kilometer sticks. But if you measure that exact same object, the, 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 the island of England here, using 100 kilometer sticks, you're going to get a different figure. It's going to be shorter because this, the, the smaller measurement, the 50 kilometer stick, gets more nuance. It can capture more of the little details that the longer sticks can't. 
Now, there's nothing magical about these two distances that I've selected here, the 50 kilometer and the 100 kilometer. Uh, you could use 10 kilometer. You could use 5 kilometer. You, you could hypothetically use basically any distance that you want. So the author of the article, How Long is the Coast of England, his answer to that question is uh, you know, twofold. One, it depends on how what tools you're using to measure them. And two, if you're using small enough tools, it's potentially infinite. Now, I suppose you might say, come back to that by saying, well, actually, the Planck length actually is the smallest possible length that we could use. So if we were using that as our basic unit of measurement, we actually would get the definitive one, and that's going to be a finite, not an infinite value. Okay, fine, fair enough, but I think you're missing the point if that's where you go, if that's your reaction. The point is, an answer to this question, how long is the coast of England, depends on the tools that we use to measure the coast of England. And what's true of the coast of England is true of basically everything else that we're choosing to measure. How, uh, how to measure something, anything, is going to be a function not only of the thing that you're measuring, but the tools that you use to measure it. This is, I think, what uh, Schaefer and Schaefer mean when they talk about the manufacturing of facts. If you measure uh, using one standard, you will get one fact. If you measure using a different standard, you will get a different fact. It's not that there isn't any objective reality out there to be had. It's that the way that we measure and talk about reality is always going to be mediated by theory. It's going to be mediated by our perspective, and we need to be open and honest about that. Okay, I want to say a little bit more about social constructivism in the broader sense, because I think there's an important takeaway here. When, when a lot of people, in particular people who are sort of trained in sort of tra classical sciences, uh, uh, hard sciences, physical sciences, uh, when they hear about social constructivism, oftentimes their eyes roll back in their skull and they start thinking that uh, uh, they're, uh, this is some sort of you know, crazy, ridiculous idea. I'm going to talk about postmodernism later on, so we will get to that sort of crazy ridiculousness, if you will. But I think that even if we reject postmodernism, uh, there is an important insight here which is worth holding on to, and that is that a lot of what we take to be independent reality, a lot of what we take to be just factual and given and there for the taking, depends on our social perspective. Now, that doesn't mean that there's nothing that's fundamentally real or that everything's a matter of perspective or that uh, there are no facts at all. None of that is the, the obvious conclusion from, from, from making this basic argument. Um, the the, the, the quote-unquote real qualities of anything that we study Study are going to be reflective and sort of in, in some ways uh, responding to uh, sort of the, the, the facts of the world, the objective facts, but they're never simply dictated by those objective facts. The world places constraints on what any particular social point of view can say is real. Uh, if you walk out of a 30-story building, you are going to fall to your death, no matter what your sort of social thinking on the nature of gravity is. I don't think anyone really, even the postmodernists, would deny that. But the way we understand the relationship between what happens, the way we talk about what happens when a person walks off a 30-story building is something that is mediated by a social perspective. It's mediated by a social construct. For example, we might, you know, talk, I mean, you know, the, 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 a physicist might be fundamentally interested in the, 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 the gravitational forces, whereas a psychologist might be fundamentally interested in what makes the person walk off, off the building in the first place. Um, the way you describe, the way you account for these things, the tools that you use uh, are, when you go into the question is going to determine the kind of answer that you get on the other side of the question. Uh, now, there's nothing, I think, fundamentally problematic about acknowledging and being honest with this fact. And that's, I think, one of the important things that the sociology of science can sort of tell us, uh, that, that we have to acknowledge our social perspective is an indelible part of what we do when we're doing science. Now, I do want to acknowledge that sometimes things do get crazy, and there are people out there who who, who take these ideas to a radical extreme, uh, uh, and that's going to be postmodern the postmodernists, which is going to be part of what I'm going to talk about in the next lecture.